Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. Hope you had a fantastic Memorial Day uh, yesterday. Hope you uh, ev hope everyone was safe. Hope you had a great time. Hope you remembered our servicemen who have paid so much to keep our country safe and free. Uh, it, you know, it really doesn't matter at this point. Uh, I think we all understand that our government has done some horrific things in the past, uh, brought about a lot of military action in which young men lost their lives, tragically so, honestly with no, with no justification. Uh, I think anyone aware of America's history would know that that has been true at given times. And yet we cannot, in spite of that, we cannot negate the fact that these young men were patriotic, they loved America, they believed that they were serving America and uh, ensuring our liberties. And so we have to appreciate the zeal and, and the fervor and the patriotism and the sacrifice that they made. Okay, we are continuing our study of the Olivet Discourse. And the, and the burning question is, is the, is the Olivet Discourse divided into two different subjects? Does it discuss the coming of the Lord in A.D. 70? Or, uh, or, and in addition to that, does it discuss some yet future end of time event? Now look, it is taken for granted, without proof I might add, it is taken for granted that Jesus is talking about two different subjects, two different comings of the Lord. Just this morning, I was reading uh, a little bit of a, of a discussion on Facebook, and there were several, quote, former preterists, unquote, who were making the claim. Now, this is remarkable. They were making the claim in, in Matthew, on Matthew 16, 27, 28, that there are two comings of the Lord in there. Verse 27, well, that's in the future. Verse 28, that was the ascension of Jesus. And this one individual who claims to have been at one time a full preterist, when you read his writings now, you doubt that. But nonetheless, he says he was a full preterist at one time. And he says, well, it's not too uncommon for the Bible uh, to speak about two separate distinct comings of the Lord without any indication in the text that it really is two comings. Really? Seriously? We're supposed to take that kind of a claim seriously? Uh, no, no, no exegesis given, no scriptural evidence given, no logical argument given, simply a presuppositional claim again, without any evidence, that, hey, the Bible commonly joins two different comings of the Lord together in the same verses without indicating them. Well, if it doesn't indicate them, then how do you know that it's talking about two events? Oh, I know, you have to interject your futurist concepts into the text. That's how you know, and it's called eisegesis, reading into the text what is not there. But I digress ever so slightly. We have been focused on Matthew 25, 14 and following about a certain man who was getting ready to go into a far country and he gathered his servants around them and he gave talents to them. One, he gave one, five, one, two, one, one. And he said, you take care of this until I come back. And after a long time, he came back. And he took accounting of those servants. Now, we are told that this passage must refer to a yet future end of time into the Christian age coming of the Lord. Well, why? Well, because it says he was gone a long time. And so these individuals who make that argument are, number one, ignoring all of the other absent master parables of Jesus, which posit the return of the absent master within the first century. And so guess what has to be done? Oh, I know. The futurist has to, once again, 
insert into some of these other absent master parables another coming of the Lord. They have to say, well, yeah, you know, Matthew 21, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the coming of the Lord in AD 70. Oh, but wait, Matthew 25 now, that's a different coming of the Lord. I see Jesus on full display. One of the passages of the absent master that we began examining last week is Mark chapter 13. And I'm going to begin reading with verse 32. Now, the context here, and remember, in Mark chapter 13, the apostles asked about one thing and one thing only. They asked about the coming destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Not a word in the questions recorded by Mark do we find a reference to Christ coming at the so-called end of time. In fact, Mark doesn't even record that they ask about Christ's coming or the end of the age. So according to Mark, the only thing the apostles asked about was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, how did Jesus answer the question? Well, he answered that by talking about his coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Then he says, But of that day and hour knows no man, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know what time it will be. It is like a man who goes into a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening or at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. So we have here the absent master. Now notice <coughs> we have the same identical motifs as in Matthew 25, 14. We have a master who goes, we have a master who goes to a far country, but he gives responsibility to his servants, and he says, you take care of this until I come back. Are we supposed to believe these are two different parables? Oh, and I ask the question again, are these two separate, distinct goings away into a far country. Now, if there are not two different going departures, then upon what basis do we say, well, yeah, it's the same departure, but it's different comings. You see, we got to have some exegetical proof for this. Now, I got to hurry here. I want you to notice, and of course, this is, as I've shared with you before, we've got something in my eye. This passage here, Mark chapter 13, verse 32, is really the crux interpretive for an, for an awful lot of people who say, well, you know, listen, up to this point, Jesus may have been talking about AD 70. But now when he says, but of that day and hour, knows no man, not even the angels nor the Son, now he's talking about the end of time. Well, once again, Mark doesn't record any such question about any such subject. You have to import that from somewhere else. Now, if you got justification for doing it, okay, that's fine, but we don't have such justification. But we are told, and <clears throat> a uh, former opponent of covenant eschatology, Wayne Jackson, who passed away fairly recently, he was commenting on, on James chapter 5, the parousia of the Lord is drawn near. And he says something like this. In Mark 13, 32, Matthew 24, 36, Jesus did not know the time, the day, or the hour of his coming. If Jesus didn't know the day and the hour of his coming, then James most assuredly didn't know it. And you read comments like this over and over and over again. And I tell you what, folks, this, what I call this anachronistic hermeneutic, controls many of the commentaries 
on the Olivet Discourse. Here's what I mean by that. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels, not even the Son, but the Father only. Okay. So when Jesus spoke those words, he didn't know, did he? Which means his apostles did not know. Clearly. But you see, those who appeal to this text and say, Jesus' quote, ignorance, unquote, applies in Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Timothy, Titus, you know, Hebrews, and on and on. Because again, to quote Wayne Jackson, if Jesus in Matthew 24, 36, Mark 13, 32, if he didn't know the time of his coming, then those writers of the epistles most assuredly did not know the time. Mr. Jackson and those like him, and they're multitudinous, are guilty of ignoring the revelatory work of the Holy Spirit. I suggest to you, <clears throat> pardon me, that to ignore the revelatory work of the Holy Spirit, which began in earnest, and focus on earnest, in Acts chapter 2, running all the way through Revelation, to ignore the work of the revelatory spirit in the epistles is to guarantee a misunderstanding of biblical eschatology. So guess what we're going to do on tomorrow's video? I'm going to share with you what Jesus, after he spoke the words in Matthew and Mark and Luke, about not knowing the day and the hour, I'm going to share with you what Jesus said about the revelatory work of the Holy Spirit and how that played out in regard to the knowledge of the writers of the New Testament in regard to eschatology, the coming of the Lord, the judgment, and the resurrection. Folks, this is important. So I'll see you on the flip side.